I remember reading an account of something that happened two days before the end of the zombie plague. The head of a DAS team got a report of a big gathering of zombies inside the tunnel under the Rosslyn metro station, just outside of D.C. So they went down there and they started poking around the tunnel and they got a call from the station chief that a train was coming in, even though they'd all been shut down that morning. So here comes a train with all its lights off, coming along real slow as the DAS squad waited on the platform. The train stopped and the doors opened, and zombies came out of three of the cars, stepping right out onto the platform. The DAS put them down quick, and then the head of the team, a guy named Vanderwall, entered the front car, but no one was in the driver's compartment. The man had run for it already. With a two or three minute head start, he got away. Vanderwall was in the dark, deep in the tunnel, when he heard footsteps behind him. He turned and saw a zombie walking his way. It was a middle-aged woman in a shawl and a baggy sweater. She was making a strange sound. When Vanderwall got to within 20 feet or so, he determined that she was singing. There were no actual words coming out of her mouth, of course. It was like a person singing in their sleep, half-mumbled words coming from deep inside the zombie's throat. Before she fell over and stayed totally motionless, anyone could tell that there was music coming from that mouth. For all Vanderwall knew, that singing woman may have been the first of the zombies to lie down and just not get up again. My name is Lionel Gathers. I'm 32, and I guess I'm just a waiter. On May 2nd, the principals of this story and I came down through Frederick, Maryland in the van, and at some point around 2 o'clock we passed a minor league baseball stadium. On some instinct I decided to cruise around it, and I saw that the center field wall had been partially removed, and the outer chain link fence that surrounded the stadium was wide open. So I drove the van through the gap in the wall and right into the outfield, and we parked it and got out. The five of us were standing in the middle of this big, empty stadium, and I tried to get a sense of the atmosphere and the silence. I asked Athena to reach into the back of the van and very carefully bring out my weapons. Only when I had my weapons did I relax. Now, when I say weapons... Yeah, it was the softball equipment my dear fiancé had bought me for Christmas. She'll claim that my whole plan as soon as I saw the stadium was to sucker everyone into playing, and that talk of a picnic was a pathetic smokescreen. And she's kind of right, but how many chances do you get? Now, a quick rundown of the athletic skills of the group. Mouses is 61 and a professor, so he can't handle anything more strenuous than cribbage. Athena is an artist and so refuses to play. Ronnie is ex-military. Actually, still military, but AWOL for six months then. So, he's got power, but he cannot handle my famous demon pitch. And Melissa is, well, a 17-year-old girl. And the fact that she hit my famous demon pitch back at my head should only be taken as an outlier situation, and not a reflection of my athletic dominance, which is total. We did get our picnic right there in the middle of the diamond. Just some roast beef sandwiches and a lot of chocolate pudding and a six-pack of Pepsi. And we all gave Melissa her birthday presents. That sunshine, that perfect weather, made me just never want to leave that day. It wouldn't have been ruined, I suppose, if Ronnie and I hadn't finished eating so early and run back to hit more balls at each other. The second one, Ronnie lucked out on, and he hit it to the right field corner and it bounced through another gap in the outfield fence into some area where it looked like they had stored away the groundskeeping equipment. I absolutely did not want to lose that ball, so he walked after it. The area behind the right field fence was actually underneath an overhang of bleacher seats. The bullpen was off to one side, and tucked to the right was a big shadowy area full of rakes and bags of grass seed and hoses and paint and that kind of thing. 
The ball had rolled into a little patch of what I figured was mulch. I picked it up and it was covered in the stuff, and I wiped it off on the ground. But the stuff was blacker than mulch, and much finer, so I saw that I was wrong. I filtered some of it through my fingers and realized what it really was. There was a corner that bent even further to the right, deeper behind the right field stands. That was where I saw what I absolutely did not want Melissa to see. Ronnie came up behind me and he saw it too. When we went back to the picnic, I guess our poker faces were were not so good. Ronnie and I babbled something about how no one should go back behind the outfield wall because there was a lot of rusty construction equipment back there in a pit just waiting for someone to fall in. And Melissa ate two more bites of her pudding and got right up and started walking into the outfield. She had some weird sense of where we'd been and what we were trying to hide. She turned to the right and we all caught up to her, and I at least found the lights inside that shed and hit them so we could all see what had happened. The walls of that room had been scarred by flame, and the equipment in it had been burned beyond recognition. I saw a lawnmower and several sections of a short wooden fence. But most of the space was empty cement floor, which was also blackened. You could make out human forms in the heaps of ash. Arms outstretched, torso still intact, hands, feet. Entire zombies, which had seemingly been in motion when they were burned. Most of them had been burned away to almost nothing. Turning around, I noticed that there was a sliding wall behind us, which could have been shut tight as they were immolated. Mouses remembered later that they had been burned so thoroughly there wasn't even that smell of rot and decay. Somewhere along the line, I suppose, I did promise Melissa that we wouldn't try to protect her from that kind of thing as long as she was with us. But that kind of promise couldn't really mean anything. It just couldn't. I mean, seeing something like what she saw in that shed... How do I explain that to someone who just turned 17 that day? And of course she brushed it off like it was nothing and called me a bozo for trying to hide it. We packed everything up, what there was to pack, and we rolled the van out of there just before dusk. And this is why I was so grateful to have Melissa with us sometimes. No one was saying much of anything a few minutes after we left the stadium. But when a Whitney Houston song came on the radio, Melissa put her hands to her ears and wailed long and loud, and claimed she would physically die and come back to life again and eat only the brains of the people inside the van if I didn't put in a CD that very second. Everybody laughed and we were past it. And that was Thursday. The thing that bothered my fiance Athena, was that neither Ronnie nor I really showed a lot of repulsion upon seeing that pile. I kind of blame something called cognitive retreat for that. That's the fancy-dancy term Mouses used for the persistent feeling of utter disconnect from the horror of the zombie situation. The so-called awakening of the dead held so many properties of the absurd, along with so many properties of the tragic and the nightmarish, that he said that society and the individual's reaction to it was simply one of functional, deeply embedded shock. It was so reminiscent of bad horror movies that we as a whole came to believe that the best way to get along was to act as if we really were in a bad horror movie. And so, Mouses used to say, grief and outrage were sublimated in favor of crazed fear and hilarity. We were all walking around in a dream. It would certainly have been different had the zombies been aggressive or attacked at will or were bent on revenge like in a video game. But there was none of that. They were as harmless as stones. And this, Mouses thought, was the true catalyst which brought about nationwide insanity. And when the zombies simply began to collapse wherever they stood and rest in peace again just a few months after they had risen, the dream state began to fade. Like no other tragedy or uproar in American history, what happened in January of 2005 did start a weird silent and shared desire amongst people all over the land to simply stop everything, everything that could be stopped, for as long as was humanly possible. The machinery of society should have gotten back up and running again in February, but it didn't. 
After a couple of weeks of hand-wringing and confusion, schools should have reopened. Small business people should have gotten back behind their counters. Bad movies should have been made. But they weren't. Workers who had left their jobs to collect themselves did not return, leaving thousands of companies scuffling to stay afloat. It was kind of like 230 years of the American way of pacing ourselves had crashed to a halt, and everyone just needed a breather, just one, before setting the wheels spinning again. Colleges wiped out entire semesters because students decided to take them off. Thousands of businesses had to close because no one felt like coming back to work the registers or make french fries. It took something truly freakish to do that. A massive tragedy with the start of a war couldn't have done it. These things make Americans want to get back to work fast, to take their minds off things. Maybe with the dead up and walking, Mouses thought there was just too much to think about, and everyone wanted to take their time sorting out the universe a little bit before getting back to the endless grind. Or maybe it wasn't even as complicated as that. Maybe everyone needed a vacation. They saw the chance for it, and they did not care. Hey, if the universe isn't going to live up to its responsibilities, why should we? Our plan after we left the stadium was to drift in a southerly way and find a place to spend the night, probably a campground. Ronnie seemed to be getting more and more concerned with being spotted somehow and arrested. And even walking around a place like that made him uneasy. So it was getting tougher for us all to agree on just where we were going. Athena didn't feel comfortable with taking Melissa more than a few hundred miles away from her home in Harrisburg. So it was all very day-to-day. We kept putting gas in the van and we kept moving, but our progress, however you define it, was slowing. We saw three or four zombies lying in an enormous field off to our right somewhere south of a place called Lime Kiln. The cleanups were still very slow. Mouses was the one who pointed out the elementary school, coming up on our left. We'd happened upon some sort of very small town, and it was going to be dark soon, so I wanted to check it out, even though Athena had her usual resistance to the idea of breaking and entering. The place was basically your average-sized school for grades 1 through 5, just one story high. Nice big playground out back, nothing special, except this one had really spiffy monkey bars. We swung the van beside the cafeteria, where it would be safely out of sight, and we took a quick walk around the side facing the woods. Most of the windows were unlocked, and we had our pick of which classrooms to enter. Mouses and Athena got the sleeping bags and the lanterns out of the van and went back in through a door Ronnie had propped open for us. So far as we could tell, no one even suspected we were in there. Not only was the water working, but there was a locker room beside the gym slash cafeteria slash auditorium and showers too, which was phenomenal. So Ronnie and I could squeeze an hour or so of shooting baskets in the gym and then we could bathe. Melissa got up on the stage with a mat she'd taken from a pile in the corner and did her Pilates and listened to the CDs I'd given to her for her birthday. And eventually it got dark. She was a little different after dark. She was visibly uneasy navigating the hallways with the lantern, and she decided to wait for morning to have her shower. She camped out in a classroom with Athena with the door closed, and didn't move for the rest of the night. And by the way, I think I beat Ronnie like 117 to 3 in basketball. I'm pretty sure that was the score. He and I and Mouses hung out in a different classroom after dark, and we had our first real discussion about things in about a week. Athena would have knocked me silly if she'd found out we were having man talk without her. But Melissa needed her company, and Ronnie had some things on his mind. Mouses had gotten real fascinated in a Lippincott fourth grade reader, and we had to snap him out of it to join the discussion. Ronnie's parents had died six weeks into the whole zombie thing. They'd gone off the deep end, paranoia-wise and hidden in a cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And at some point during their hiding, something had gone wrong with the heating system, and they'd apparently died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Their possessions had been found in the cabin, and their car was there, and there was physical evidence of a huge carbon monoxide leak. But they were gone. So, 
you can sort of deduce what had become of them. So in the very beginning, our idea had been to slowly work our way down to Georgia, where his parents would have been. Being AWOL, he couldn't use his real name, so he had no idea how he would go about finding out where his parents were. He just wanted to make sure they were buried properly. Maybe if he just drove around Athens, he thought, he might find them. He couldn't really decide if it was something he truly wanted to do, so he didn't object to our slow going. Not at all. It gave him time to think, to prepare himself, maybe. Meanwhile, we'd been zigzagging across Pennsylvania like vagrants. The thing was, did we take Melissa all the way down to Georgia? Did we go all the way with this adventure like I wanted to? Bringing Melissa along meant being somewhat responsible, which of course ruins every great plan, and we couldn't decide what was best to do, to keep puttering around the Northeast like kids or roam the South like total potheads. Mouses was a pothead in the 60s, you know, he told me so. Like I couldn't have figured that out for myself. Anyone that rational and academic had to be covering for some serious toking in bygone years. We had the radio on, and literally right in the middle of the conversation, someone came on WAMU with a story about how the AWOL amnesty was not only being shortened, but the penalties for getting caught beyond that had been stiffened like the wrath of God. Three years in jail for desertion. Suddenly, Ronnie didn't have till the end of July to turn himself in. He had until next Wednesday. Mouses found me in the art room around midnight. We sat for a while and looked out the window which overlooked the playground. I asked the old coot the one thing I always did whenever we were away from everyone else, which was how long he thought we had out here on the run from everything that mattered. More specifically, how long it would be before the world was able to move on. He had seen some equipment out on the blacktop where the basketball hoops were in the courtyard, and he'd gone out there and checked it out because he had a hunch about what that stuff was. He said they were relining the blacktop and filling in the sand around the monkey bars. It was impossible to tell when that stuff had been brought in, but maybe they were preparing the grounds for the September school year or even summer school. That made more sense. That's why they were doing it now, not in August. He thought the kids were going to come back soon. So we had to leave soon, but where would we go? For Mouses, the goal of this whole thing was to stave off the miasma of his recent retirement for a few more months. For Ronnie, it was to escape from the law. But at what point would this mean having to sleep illegally in motels and shop in packed supermarkets? And God forbid, go back to work. Dear Sis, I thought I'd record you a little letter this time instead of writing one out. I have this little mini cassette recorder that uh, Athena bought me for Christmas. So, um, something very interesting happened to me the other night. I've been knocking around the state with a little group of people that Athena and I uh, managed to collect somehow. Her mentor at the university from when she was 22. Uh, an ex-military guy named Ronnie who got into a little bit of trouble, apparently, and took off from that whole mess. And our next-door neighbor's kid from Harrisburg, uh, Melissa. She's 17. And uh, she lobbied hard to come with us, much to the ire of her parents, but they didn't have a whole lot of say in the matter. Anyway, we've been moving from place to place, and one night we pitched camp inside... Gerard Manley Hopkins Elementary School in Buckystown, Maryland. So in the middle of the night, I was up and poking around with a lantern around the principal's office. And uh, I was just bored. I couldn't sleep. At one point, I had to go to the bathroom. And while I was standing at the um, fountain, I got the shock of my life because I saw that someone was watching me. It was a zombie standing just outside the window. She was about 60, I would say, and she was wearing a blue house dress. I hadn't seen more than four or five of them on their feet since they all started to lie down again. I actually moved a little closer to her. And the strangest part of it was, I thought I had seen this zombie somewhere before. Now, theoretically, that's probably impossible, because we've just been moving a little too fast for 
a single zombie to keep up with us, but the feeling of deja vu was pretty powerful. She gawked at me for like 15 seconds, and then the zombie turned and walked off toward the playground. But just before I started recording this letter to you, I had a sudden flash about where I'd seen that zombie before. The next day, Friday, we all got in the van after our granola breakfast and went out exploring a little. We decided to hang on to our little elementary school haven just until Monday. After only three and a half weeks on the road, we had gotten somehow really tired. Athena never saw a farm stand she could pass up, so that was the first place we stopped. It was at the bottom of a huge, sloping field, and there was a nice little house at the top of it, about 200 yards away, and in the driveway, I saw a specimen control van. The driveway led all the way down the slope until it hit the road just about 70 feet or so from where the little vegetable stand was, so I figured the girl taking our money and handing us the bags of strawberries must have known about the van and why it was there. She was maybe 22 or so, working the stand alone. So here we were, five customers at a fruit stand, and four of us staring up at this specimen control van, only Melissa still engrossed in the cantaloupes, And of course, the girl running the stand had to notice. So she told us what the van was about. Her name was Donna. Her grandfather's doctor had called the specimen control people a couple of days before because that was the law. And they called them back to make sure they were going to be there. And then they came, kind of late at night. And they showed the family what to do when their grandpa died. It was almost like a weird little class they gave them in the living room. They took a look at the bed he lay in and then gave the family the correct restraints for it and showed them how to tie them. They showed them how to tape his eyes down so he wouldn't be able to see anything if he came awake again. They had them take everything out of the room that they could except for a couple of chairs. They said that when he died, they should take just a few minutes alone with him and make sure the window was sealed tight and wedge a block the guys gave them underneath the door and adjust it with a little tool so that the door couldn't be opened from inside. And then Donna was supposed to call them right away, and they would come and take him away. So they signed something, and the two specimen control guys told them they'd do what they were supposed to do, and the hospice woman went back upstairs to sit with Grandpa. But uh, the, the kind of funny part was, the two guys who gave the family the talk couldn't get their van started when they went out to leave. They tried and tried, and Donna's brother tried to give them a jump start, but nothing worked. So he tinkered around in there and he figured out that their alternator was fried and the van wasn't going anywhere. It was almost 11 o'clock by then, so Donna's brother said that if they wanted, he could run over to his friend Larry's parts place and get them a used replacement alternator and put it in for him, rather than have them wait for a tow and maybe not have the van fixed till who knows when by some garage. The specimen control guys, Don and Cal were their names, said that would be great, but they didn't want to impose. But Donna's brother got in his Mercury, and went off to Larry's, and the Don and Cal guys wound up staying with them and watching the end of a rerun of Seinfeld down in the living room while Donna and the hospice woman stayed up with Grandpa. And then Donna's mother said everyone looked hungry, so she made everyone breakfast at one in the morning, plenty of eggs and waffles and bacon. And even though Donna's brother had just about fixed the van by then, Don and Cal were more than happy to stay and eat breakfast. They wound up calling into their dispatcher and staying the night. Donna figured the guys would get in the van and leave as soon as the family woke up, but they didn't. Mom cooked for them again and had the food ready as soon as they got up, and Grandpa wasn't looking so good. So the guys called in again and said they were just going to wait there until they got another call they absolutely had to take. Donna's Grandpa finally passed. Don and Cal told Donna it would be best if the Family got into the car and went for a little drive together, just for a half hour or so, while they took care of things. When they returned, Don and Cal had taken Grandpa away and set everything back in the bedroom just the way they'd had it to begin with. And they'd left a note thanking the family for being so nice to them, with their phone numbers in case they ever needed them for any reason. And they intended to come right back as soon as they could, just to help move Grandpa's things to the shed, like the family had meant to do. 
and they wrote that if they or anyone they knew needed their car looked at, they would be happy to send Donna's brother the business instead of calling a garage. After we met Donna, we were just tooling around looking for a place to do some laundry, and Athena was poking through the town newspaper, which was the first thing she did whenever we went into a new town, and she spotted something in the events calendar and said we had to take a spin by the Bucky's Town Cultural Center because there was an art exhibit she wanted to check out. These were some of Melissa's favorite parts about the trip when Athena would force us to go see these little out-of-the-way art galleries. Melissa giving her a quick education about this and that. If I had tried to tell Melissa who Modigliani was, she would have put her headphones on and stuck an L on her forehead. Uh, I should never have admitted to her I'd been waiting tables at Ruby Tuesday. She lost all respect for me when she saw me in my uniform. The Bucky's Town Cultural Center was just the kind of place Athena wanted to run someday. It was in a little sliver of a row house between a flower shop and a laundromat. So I would have the perfect excuse to hop out early if it turned out we were due for a half hour of pottery or Egyptian beads. And wouldn't you know it, the subject of this week's exhibit was The Walking Dead in Art and Memory. That didn't dissuade my fiancé. She just wants to lap up everything cultural. She's a fiend. To me, culture is when there's a Simpsons marathon on, and I have a box of Ritz crackers handy. So yeah, I am willing to field questions about how she wound up stuck on me. The exhibit right in front was really strange. It was called Seven Days with Lev. Some photographer had just randomly decided to call a zombie Lev and followed him around for a week, snapping photos of him as he went. And the last photo was of Lev getting cremated. I figured the photographer had reported him. The best photo, in Ronnie's opinion, was this gorgeous shot of a creek somewhere up in the mountains, a real Ansel Adams type of thing. Snow everywhere. Snow was actually falling as the picture was snapped. And way in the back of the frame there was a deer looking at the surface of a creek. And across the bank from it was a zombie, just watching it. Except he had one arm lifted toward the deer like he was going to ask him a question. There was one very, very good photo of a zombie's face, very close up, with the camera maybe eight inches away. So well done, I was very surprised I'd never seen it in a magazine or a newspaper before. It reminded me of that old National Geographic cover of the young uh, Middle Eastern girl, the one with the big blue eyes. The zombie in this photo was quite old, and its hair was flying about its head crazily. But there was a strange glimmer of something in its eyes. Or maybe it was just the way the eyes were directed, past the cameraman at some unseen horizon, as if the zombie were contemplating a long journey. Melissa couldn't take her eyes off it. We'd been there for 15 minutes when Athena came up to me, ashen-faced, and just tugged on my sleeve and guided me into one of the smaller side rooms, and she pointed. And I saw that one of the paintings was her own. It was, if you remember me at all, hanging beside a window. She'd painted, if you remember me at all, two years before, and it was sold at a group show in Philadelphia to a man who owned 30% of a pro basketball team. And the painting had been packed for him, and Athena had taken his check, and she'd never seen it again. So you can figure out for yourself, of course, that since the painting was two years old, it had absolutely nothing to do with the living dead. The man shown in the painting climbing the brick fence that divided a cemetery from the grounds of a sheet metal foundry was not a zombie, but because his features were so obscured. What could anyone else have thought, standing there in an art gallery, surrounded by the undead, having no clue that Athena had been painting an image she'd remembered from when she was a child and visiting her father at the foundry. The man in the painting was a co-worker of his who sometimes hopped over the boundary fence to have his lunch there. Athena's work had a price tag on it and it was selling for about a third of what she'd originally gotten for it with all the proceeds going to the art center. So apparently the guy who'd originally bought it had donated it outright to them. Maybe the associations it had were just too eerie once the zombie started to walk, and it was too odd to have that piece hanging on his wall. 
Athena didn't put up any kind of fuss at all about it. I suppose there wouldn't have been much point. But she was a little bit different through the rest of the day. That painting thing had really gotten to her. It just kind of drove it home. How much had slipped away because of the damn zombies. I saw Melissa talking to some guy in his 40s off to the side. And at first I thought he was just asking her directions or something, but then he pulled out a business card and he gave it to her, so I drifted over to see what was up. You know, I'm supposed to be some kind of father figure here. Temporary one, of course. The man had just come out and introduced himself to her as Douglas Widgen, a freelance TV producer. And he said he was beginning work on a documentary about how the whole zombie thing had affected people in their teens, and even younger than that. And he was looking for people to interview, for money too. He said he was paying for the interview, so Melissa had no problem with that. The concept of the documentary would be, yes, the effects of the crisis on Americans to whom this was the first real catastrophe they were fully cognizant of, and to a lesser extent how it affected their view of God and their own mortality, which they hadn't even had a chance to fully grasp yet. This was something... Douglas Widgen hadn't bothered to shop around first. He just wanted to do it. To grab a cameraman from nearby WHTK and make it a weekend project. Turn it around in three months. Athena told Melissa she had no real objections to her being in the documentary. And Widgen was offering a couple of hundred bucks for a few hours of her time. Plus, he said if we liked, we could go out to his car and he would show us the questions he'd prepared for it. He could call his friend the cameraman and he could tape that afternoon and we could be on our way. And since we were right next door to this cute little cafe, we all decided to have lunch over it. Over BLTs, Widgen told us about his work in TV, and that eventually led to him speaking of a reality show that one network had supposedly talked about, one which I didn't really think was possible. Athena, though, believed it right away. She despises TV. Widgen said he'd been talking to a friend of his at CBS about pitching them a World War II documentary. And this guy told him, of course, that their news division pretty much got priority for everything, and it was all about zombies, and everything else was low priority. And the guy related an idea for a reality show that he'd heard kicked around for a couple of weeks. It was the baby of the guy who had produced Time Machine 2005, which, as stupid as it was, had actually been a clever idea once. Apparently, he'd been talking with someone about going out and somehow getting a hundred zombies or so, and cooping them up somewhere in the east for a few months, and then transporting them to an island off Florida. And the show would consist of just one man or woman, or maybe a married couple, who had to live on that island with the zombies for a full year, constantly in fear of getting scratched or something, you would figure, and just plain weirded out every single day. Maybe they would take a very pacifist person, and plop them down there on the island and watch how over the course of a year, irritated by even harmless zombies 24 hours a day, they might resort to a bit of the old ultra-violence. As Athena put it, you can go on the internet any time you want and buy a bumper sticker that says, My other car is a specimen control van. Or, Thanks, Elvis, for staying in your grave. So why would anyone think this reality show couldn't possibly happen? Let's get real here for just a moment she would say. We'll all be the better for it. So, sis, we left the bright lights of Bucky's Town and we found a very nice creek to hang out beside for a couple of hours, since the weather was freakishly perfect once again. We made a mental note to camp there whenever we left the elementary school, and at one point in my wandering around, I found a hiking trail and I wandered along it for a little bit. And there on the trail, I swear on our mother's macaroni and cheese, was the zombie I had seen the night before, the one who spied on me as I relieved myself. She was about 50 yards away, and she was walking right towards me. When she got to within about 30 feet or so, she stopped and took a left and wandered deeper into the woods. Then I had an idea, which I was certain wouldn't work, but I figured I had nothing to lose. I ran back to the creek and I rummaged around in Athena's things till I found her camera. And then I dashed back toward the trail again and I went off in search of my stalker zombie. She had moseyed off the path and she was walking through a pretty little meadow. 
for the first time ever, I actually went towards a zombie, jogging in a very, very wide circle around this woman, and finally positioning myself in front of her, like 50 yards away, kind of hiding lamely behind a tree. At that moment, I had my worst ever case of the chills. All it took to bring them on was the sound of that woman's footsteps through the grass and the leaves. The footsteps stopped entirely for a moment as if she were figuring out where I had gone to. And then they started again. They got quieter as she hit a patch of what I guess was smooth dirt. Then there was a crunch as a stick was stepped on and broken. The sounds of those footsteps just could not be real, and I, I couldn't be hiding behind a tree listening to them get closer, but there I was. For a moment, I was really terrified for the entire human race, because, obviously, all bets were off. When the zombie went past me, I stepped out, and I made a sound that was kind of like, Ha! And when her head turned, I snapped a photo of her face. She just stood there looking at me, so I ran off and got the hell out of there. I'm going to have that photograph developed very soon. It's kind of a plan I have cooking to satisfy my curiosity about where I'd seen that zombie before. I was sitting on my sofa on Porch Lane when the reports from Vancouver came on the local news back in January. I had the same reaction as everyone else, more or less. But not even a week had gone by before I got sort of pensive. And Athena could already tell what I was thinking about. I hadn't even considered going back to work as soon as the first reports came out. I suspected this was going to change everything. And yes, okay, I was yearning for it. I took the van out a lot and just drove around, and I feel guilty now about how excited I sounded sometimes when I told Athena I'd seen military convoys and more and more businesses temporarily shut down for no other reason than it was acceptable to do it. I was about to be free. I can't really describe what that felt like. I remember running across the street to Mouses' house and banging on the screen door. I tried to frame my whole idea as a sociology trip figuring that might con him into joining us. But the fact was, he just didn't have a whole lot else going on. Those first few days of riding were the best, because the uncertainty of what was going on, with almost but not quite all the undead packing it in and laying down, made it seem like we had wandered into some strange costume party where there were no rules. I loved it, I admit it. You know why? Because when I was at the wheel of the van, I wasn't a waiter or a bookstore clerk or an office temp anymore. I was a guy driving my girlfriend and a professor of military history, and later, a couple of more friends we met. I was a guy with an idea. Anyway, our new, slightly expanded gang all got to bed, meaning our sleeping bags, pretty late on the night that we had met Douglas Widgeon. He came to the school at about nine with his cameraman, and we'd forgotten to tell him that there was no power in the schools. So they had a little problem with the lighting. Melissa wound up being interviewed by the light of the lanterns we had, which Widgeon said would be fine. He talked to her for about an hour and a half, and Widgeon stayed after that, just to join in on the drinking, which took place in Principal Polly's office. We sat around and had some beer, me and Mouses and Ronnie and Widgeon. And Widgeon told us some good stories about the TV biz. And we found out that he turned down a scholarship to Harvard when he was 19 out of some kind of crazy dream of being a world adventurer. Widgeon drank too much and decided to sleep in one of the classrooms. Since the next day, he wanted to hang around for a bit and grab some second unit stuff of Melissa. And I was just about to leave and find Athena and crash out when the news came on the radio and they talked about how some soldiers posted in Manhattan had claimed they were attacked by three zombies. And one of those zombies had taken a bite out of a soldier's arm. There was a very disturbing sound clip from him about how the zombie's eyes never moved when he was biting him, just grabbed a hold of his elbow and sunk his teeth in. 
When the story was over, I looked at Ronnie, and Ronnie looked at me, and he said, It's a goddamn lie, Lionel. With more bitterness than I had ever seen in him before. The first time Ronnie's unit was sent out to take zombies down, it was a nasty, rainy Sunday night, cold, ugly, just the worst possible January situation you could ever want to have, and they were called off the New Jersey Turnpike to go into Atlantic City. Just eight guys and two trucks. They knew they were going to have to shoot some zombies down really soon, but not in this kind of ungodly weather, and not that late at night. But Ronnie's CEO told them over the radio that they were needed on the beach. The problem was no one had told his unit where on the beach they should go. The entire freaking city is on the beach, so they just headed in from the expressway, went down Pacific Avenue, and slowed the trucks next to the Sands Hotel, and got out. It was about 90 seconds before they had something. There were about seven zombies walking along the shore. That was an image that had just blown his mind. They were standing in the rain, freezing, eight of them, armed, with the ocean off to the right, the surf really coming in hard, their breath billowing out, and the zombies on the tide line backlit in the strange cloud of light coming from the casinos. The rain and the mist from the ocean was hanging in the air and the lights of the boardwalk and all the hotels shone through it and made it completely spectral. They took them all down and they looked up and there were more shadows on the beach. But these were regular people a hundred yards away who had left their hotels and come out to watch. Not one of them had an umbrella. They were so afraid they were going to miss something they just went out without them. Four or five people just watching with newspapers, covering their heads. I will end this chapter of the story by trying to describe to you what you see in scene seven of Song of the Living Dead, which is the name of Douglas Widgeon's documentary, shown on Minnesota Public Television in December of 2006. The narrator talks about how our own Melissa Lansford, was going through the zombie crisis without her parents, but by choice. She'd always had problems with her mother and father's rules, and the zombie crisis quickly intensified the strain to the breaking point. When Melissa's parents decided to flee to Newfoundland during the second week of the dead's return and completely seclude themselves until it was all over, Melissa refused to go with them. Instead, she told them she would stay with some adult friends of hers who planned to wait out the crisis on the road, moving from town to town, observing what was happening to the country. She's very much a typical 17-year-old girl, the narrator says. There's something different about Melissa, though, and there has been ever since the first week of the crisis. And then Melissa tells the story of how one night, at about two in the morning, she got up to get something to drink from the kitchen, and she didn't bother turning the lights on or anything. And she was just standing there, stirring sugar into this pitcher of iced tea. And there was a shadow right at the doorway, out of nowhere. It hadn't made any sound at all. There was only this little, tiny sound when it shuffled its foot forward onto the floor, and that was it. It was just so much taller than Melissa's father, she knew instantly what it was. And she was right next to the drawer where all the cooking stuff was. And she just opened it and felt around for a second and grabbed a big carving knife. And she went towards the shadow and she started wailing away at it, she said. She didn't think about it. She just took a few steps and started stabbing it. She supposed she was mad that it could just wander in like that. Her parents, rushing in, panicked, went insane, and her father grabbed her and let her out of there. And her mother ran out too screaming hysterically, which Melissa thought was pathetic. She said they freaked out more than anyone about this whole thing, and she thought they'd gone so nuts that it made them forget the obvious things like locking the front door at night. Douglas Widgeon asks Melissa on screen what it felt like to stab that person with a knife, and she says she doesn't remember that part of it. It got blacked out somehow. She remembers grabbing the knife out of the drawer and walking towards the shadow, 
but it kind of cuts out there. Melissa then goes on to explain her theory of life as the screen is filled with shots of some pictures she put up in her room at the elementary school. Pictures from magazines of bands she liked and animals. People get so bogged down in their problems, she explains, but they bring so much of it on themselves. Her parents were that way too. It seemed to her like when you're going about your business, every problem or every little thing that can cause you stress is sort of like a big heavy suitcase just lying on the ground. If you don't want to pick it up, you don't have to. You can just keep walking right on past it if you want, and you don't have to let the suitcases bog you down. Her parents picked up every suitcase that got in their way, like a lot of people. Just walk right past. I woke up real, real early on Saturday because my plan was to somehow get breakfast bought and prepared for these people, starting with Athena because it was the anniversary of the day we'd met, which meant she would be awoken with apple juice and an egg McMuffin. Mouses was obviously up for a reason. He looked real strange, pale, and kind of shambling along towards me. And he said to me, Lionel, would you mind dropping me off at a hospital if you're going out? I do believe I've had some sort of heart attack. A very unique experience, an experience full of contrasts, he described it to us later. When he'd woken up, he'd felt a bit disconnected, an odd floating sensation as if his body were trying to levitate itself, but it just couldn't. His entire left side was very warm, and he had no clue where he was, what day it was, or what his last name was. For some reason, he looked down at his right hand and thought, Wow, look how old I am. Look at that wrinkled skin. I'm really up there. How did that happen? Athena whisked herself out of her sleeping bag, and she came along. Mouses didn't need us to help him out or anything, and he didn't even seem to want us to touch him. He got into the front seat of the van, and we went off. And I was very nervous because one moment I was absolutely sure where the hospital was, and the next moment I wasn't so positive of it. The landmarks weren't where I thought they were. So I went on faith, and I didn't tell Mouses or Athena that I had these doubts. I didn't want to worry them until I had to. I guessed in the end. For a bad second, I thought I was completely lost. But it turned out I got it right. We went into the emergency room, and they were very quick and responsive. Mouses was scared. Of course he was scared. He was being far too funny about the whole thing. That sort of gallows humor, you know. But his face, gray as a blanket. The doctor told us he was going to have to run a bunch of tests. So Athena and I drove to McDonald's, and I bought her that anniversary breakfast, which cheered her up for a little while, not too long. She was quite fond of that overly literate, bearded, old war horse, you know. We still had some time to kill, so we decided to just get outdoors for a while, and breathe in some air that wasn't full of chalk dust. Maybe a half mile from the hospital, there was a nice empty park with tennis courts and a playground, and two or three soccer fields. So we took a brisk walk through that. It was another gorgeous morning, and it was going to be another gorgeous day. All spring, perfect. Day after day, that's my memory of the weather. I might just be putting a positive spin on it, but even Athena started talking about how flawless it had been. As if we were living in Northern California, just like a certain sister of mine who thinks she's cooler than everyone else just because she hasn't seen snow in eight years. Past that park, the surroundings got even nicer and more serene. There was a long downslope that ended beside a little creek and a field beside it with croquet wickets set up. And of course it was ruined, as these things so often are, by the presence of a zombie. This one was dead or asleep or gone to rest, however you refer to it just like the vast majority of the others. It was lying in that field near the creek in some tall grass. We felt the need to walk past it just to confirm it wasn't a homeless person or something. What the zombie was wearing was kind of puzzling. A long, 
flowing, pink bridesmaid's dress. Not a very attractive one, Athena said. When Athena saw that, she got very quiet and very sad. We kind of crouched beside the dead woman and looked at her for a while. Her eyes were a little bit open, and Athena looked into them for a while, silently, studying her, I guess. Maybe artistically. There was one dandelion touching her forehead. Then there was a gunshot. And what came next was just too horrible to think about. The bullet hit the bridesmaid in the face. So the shot must have come from across the creek in the woods. The bullet just made it come entirely apart in the blink of an eye. And one second after that, a second shot hit the zombie's head again in the same place, more or less. And Athena shrieked and grabbed me and I wrenched her away from where we were standing, about five feet away from the body which all of a sudden was a torso and legs and a dress with nothing that was recognizable as a head. I had my arm around Athena's shoulder and I half carried her up the slope. She was coughing, sick, and making a strange sound deep inside her chest as if she were vibrating from the force of her shock and her fear. I sort of knew what had happened, that the bridesmaid was just target practice for someone, some vicious bastard who had thought it would be a good sport to frighten us and do some damage to a zombie at the same time. God knows why I just assumed that. Why both of us did. Why we didn't assume someone was trying to kill us both. Anyway, we got into the van and drove away. Athena didn't cry. She just doesn't cry. It's not her way. And that was how, in conjunction with Mouse's stroke, a perfect spring day became something totally different once again. Just like at the baseball stadium with that room full of ashes. I held Athena for a long time as we sat in the parking lot of the hospital. Finally, she said, I really want to go home, Lionel. And I said, I know. And I told her we'd talk about it that night, when everything had settled down. Happy anniversary. Mouses had had an arrhythmia. Mouses who claimed to have never been sick a day in his life And when the doctor went through his medical records, that pretty much confirmed it. And now the doctor was giving him a list of 500 things to be careful of and told him that he had to get tested for various things every two months for a while. Mouses refused to stay the night and said the experience of it would not be worth the extra few years they wanted to tack onto his life. And Athena said, well, I'm going to make sure you go back for the tests, old man, whether you like it or not. All we said about our morning walk was that we'd seen an unpleasant sight or two. Nothing more. Everyone was up and around by the time we got back, of course, so we told them what Mouses had been through. And everyone treated him with kid gloves, which, instead of irritating him, seemed to bring him a little satisfaction. And Douglas Widgeon was still there, which kind of surprised me. I really think he wanted Ronnie to open up about his military experiences on the cleanup squads especially about the new AWOL law. And maybe he was just there to work him a bit, but beyond that, it could be that he was just a little lonely. He'd gone through a pretty sad divorce, apparently. And for him, spending Saturday with us was just more fun than knocking around his apartment all day. We all sort of did our own thing for a couple of hours. When the stranger came, I know Ronnie was in the gym, shooting baskets, Mouses was sitting on the playground reading some Thomas Mann book, I think it was Bud and Brooks, and talking with Widgeon about heart treatments. Widgeon's father had died of a stroke ten years before. Athena was in the music room, fiddling with the piano there. I was showing Melissa how to fix some things on the van. She was a great show-me-how-to-do-that girl whenever she got bored. So I was showing her how to fill the washer fluid and top off the oil. And a great Cadillac pulled into the parking lot. I should have parked the van around back and out of sight, of course, but after that morning I I hadn't been thinking. This guy in his late 40s, early 50s, got out, guy in very good shape, with a faint southern accent, and he came over and asked if we needed help with anything, if we were having mechanical problems. He introduced himself as Henry. He asked me, I don't know, a couple of questions about the van, 
But the most obvious question, which was why we were there, he didn't ask. I had an answer prepared that we were going to knock some golf balls around the field out back. Henry mostly asked what we thought about the morning news reports out of Salt Lake City, which we hadn't heard yet. He said people had been talking about a group of zombies that had attacked people in a bank, but mostly it had seemed unsubstantiated, and he hadn't even heard it on more than one station. Finally, he left. He gave us a little wave, and he rolled his Cadillac out onto the main road and drove out of sight. Then we went back in, and Ronnie was waiting right inside the door. And the first thing he said to me was, Lionel, I've got to get out of here, and now. He said that the man I'd just been speaking to was definitely military, and that he was going to be back very soon. Ronnie had been watching the whole encounter, and he said he could tell from the guy's walk that he was military. Every little thing about him, he was sure of it. I was kind of lost. I said, Jesus, Ronnie, they're really looking for you? What the hell do you know? He thought the guy might be back with MPs within minutes. We were all walking down the hallway then, and Athena came out of the room she was in, asking what was up. Ronnie grabbed his backpack from the classroom he'd been sleeping in and started looking around for his wallet. Melissa just looked scared. Ronnie was going to go out the back. He didn't want us to just hop in the van and go in case we were pulled over by the MPs. So we decided we'd meet him on the little street around the corner from the art center we'd been at, at nine that night. He really wanted us to disappear until then, if not for his sake, then because the next time someone came to ask questions, we might get into trouble for being inside the school, and that would give someone an excuse to hold us and pelt us with questions about where Ronnie had gone to. He had no idea where he was going to go. He didn't know anything in the area, so he thought he'd just head deeper into the woods for a while, figure out his way from there, find some dive bar maybe, and read a book with his chair facing the front window for a while. Anyway, for all he knew, when he left us and went into the woods and got attacked 50 feet in, he was one of the first people to actually get into a serious dangerous fight with a zombie who wanted to kill him. It was a little tense between me and Athena when we gathered up our things. She kind of answered me in either monosyllables or pointing, as if to say, All right, if you say we have no time to talk, we have no time to talk. Let's be out of here and forget we were ever here. That's fine. We're done with this place. Now you need to be as fast as you've asked us to be. Come on. And then we were in the van and driving away, very quickly. Widgeon had climbed into the van with us, without ever giving a care to his own car. At first, we just went grocery shopping. Then Athena suggested we all splurge a little and have a really good meal at a restaurant somewhere. Some place where Mouses could eat really terribly, since the next day he'd have to start really watching himself. We wound up at some sleazy place with pool tables because that's where everyone wanted to go secretly. In the middle of me destroying Widgeon at Pool, they switched the TVs in the place over to CNN, which was reporting three more confirmed attacks by zombies, those previously docile or just plain inert zombies. That entire restaurant was just riveted to the TV. We were a little bit late in meeting Ronnie because we got kind of lost, You'd have really thought that with all our back roads driving, we would have seen some zombies, but no. We kept the radio tuned to the news. For now, they were still going on with regular programming. Ronnie was sitting on the steps of the art center with his head down. He got in the van, and you couldn't help but notice that the left sleeve of his t-shirt was gone. I asked him about it right off, and he said, Well, you know, it's been a really, really interesting evening. He hadn't been 500 feet into the woods next to the school when it happened. There was a very thin trail beaten down and leading back into the heavier brush where it eventually ended. But standing in the center of the trail, shambling towards him, was an old man in a brown suit, a zombie, walking no faster than they always did, really. Ronnie was going to give it a wide berth just because that was his instinct, everyone's instinct, to avoid them. But this one was coming right at him, so Ronnie started to run at him. He was going to elbow him 
out of the way as he ran, just to get past him as fast as he could, and not have to absorb too much detail. He swung his elbow when he was within two feet, and out of nowhere the old guy lunged at him, lunged at his neck. Ronnie dragged him along for a few feet, and he wasn't letting go. Ronnie had never really felt one like that up close in direct contact, and he was so repulsed that for a second he didn't even fight back. And then the zombie opened his mouth with his cornea still invisible, just two white scleras. And he went for a bite of Ronnie's leg. And then with one question from Widgeon, Ronnie finally began to talk, really talk, and open up about all the other things we'd wondered about. His time with the cleanup squads, the inflated statistics he claimed were designed to scare the public, the time he gashed his hand on a railing and had to be hospitalized and found that his medical records later showed that he'd contracted STG from a zombie scratch, which he had not. Another statistical lie to get the world to believe we were all in terrible danger. And so we should look the other way as land was reclaimed, boundaries redrawn, political enemies muted, Pharmaceutical contracts signed to make millions off an antibiotic no one really needed. STG didn't exist, Ronnie said. And when he'd fought to get his medical record corrected, he'd found nothing but evasions and excuses, and he was mysteriously placed on lesser details. Ronnie sat there cross-legged in the van, and he got more and more worked up, and sometimes Mouses would furrow his brow the way he does, and he'd say, I'm sorry, Ronnie, I, I, I don't understand one thing. And he would ever so delicately redirect Ronnie back to a fact that didn't jibe. It made Ronnie grow more and more frustrated until he seemed to not be Ronnie anymore. The big guy is handsome as a movie star, and occasionally better with words than even mouses, disappeared, and we found ourselves listening to a conspiracy theorist we'd never known was there. Some of it seemed plausible, but some of it seemed, well, the storyline just didn't work. But Ronnie, Mouse has said one more time, if that's true, then what doesn't make sense is that dozens of independent organizations have... And Ronnie cut him off right there. Look, I'm telling you the people running the show are capable of anything, he insisted, right in the face, until we all fell silent and just let him finish. A young boy came out in him, one wanting to blame his troubles on monsters that no one could quite see. I know he was telling us the truth as he saw it, but how likely were they really to come after him? And how much of it was him trying to convince himself that he wasn't to blame for his mistake of going into the army when he hadn't really understood it? I had no trouble accepting the notion that they'd gotten loose with statistics and records, exaggerated the STG menace to the media, gone a little bit mad with power. But Ronnie was taking it further. He was asking us to believe in a conspiracy against him, in some monolithic entity that suddenly had his personal ruination in mind. Maybe there was a point when Ronnie simply wanted a truth that wasn't quite really there, and he reached for it, because it gave him license to make his past into something they had destroyed not something he'd lost himself. Uh, I'm sorry, Ronnie. I'm sorry, man. A military convoy went past us as we drove along 80, a bigger one than we had seen before, about six or seven trucks. We turned the radio back on, and the news station was going live now with all kinds of reports of scattered zombies getting violent. The radio commentators began to repeat themselves trying to fill up dead air, as it were. And then they gave up, and classical music came back on. Athena was scanning the map, and she found a campground a mile away near Lake Linganore. So we checked it out. Mouses and Widgeon... Sorry, I know I should call them by their first names. Mouses and Widgeon went in and got us a cabin for the night, one of those rickety things with some bunk beds and nothing else. He said the woman behind the counter in the reservation's hut didn't seem to notice anything out of the ordinary about the night, except that it was really, really slow. That was a very unsettling feeling, bringing the sleeping bags and such into the cabin, 
because we were all now keeping one eye out for shambling things that might come after us. There was not a sound around the campground. We didn't see any zombies that night. When Melissa really, really had to go to the bathroom bad, me and Douglas walked her over. Wouldn't that be hilarious, Melissa said, if that's how one got me? Because I went into a stall and it jumped on me, and I got eaten just because I wanted to go have a pee? Douglas and I didn't really think that was funny. Melissa told us to lighten up. Douglas and I had no one to call, really. Funny how it really sank into him that night that he had no one to call. Even Melissa left a message on her father's cell phone, telling him she was safe and all right, and Mouses left a message at the desk of his mother's nursing home. In a strange way, Douglas said, it felt like something was happening to him for the first time in a very long time. Athena and I were the first ones to wake up the next morning. She and I crept out of the cabin and walked down to the reservation's hut, where there was a television set that hadn't been on the night before, but we figured we could ask the woman to flip it on for us. But the woman was standing out in front of the building, and there were four or five people there, too, in a circle around a dead body in the grass. They'd been waiting for a specimen control van to show up for an hour and a half, but none had come. One of the campers, who had been sleeping on the other side of the campground from us, had a zombie stumble right over his little one-man tent, collapsing it right on him. And then the zombie had pawed against the tent until the man had scrambled out, and the zombie went after him. The guy had been forced to kill it. I found Mouses' letter on my bunk a half hour later. Lionel, it said. No sleep for me tonight, I'm afraid. I'm not terribly worried about zombies or my own defective heart. It's just the usual insomnia of an old guy trying to figure things out for himself. I think the best thing for me to do now is step off this cruise ship and head back to Porch Lane. If not right away, then maybe first to my mother's nursing home to check in on her. If it happens that I'm not around when things get back to normal, if they ever do, it doesn't necessarily mean I've gone to my last reward, or they've thrown me into an old age home myself. It might mean that I've gone off on my own little trip. I'm interested in seeing what a 61-year-old man can absorb from his country on the road when things are at their strangest. It's time to be alone again, truly alone, which is something I haven't experienced in almost 40 years. I have to do this now, I believe, because I can't quite escape Athena's sentiment that to grow old alone is the worst curse anyone can endure. And this feels like the last time I'll be able to stand by myself without fearing that curse. Every instinct I have tells me that it's time for you to go home now too, Lionel. Not because you've seen all there is to see, but because you'll be risking too much by going on. Melissa, Ronnie, and I have gotten much out of our little vacation from reality, but I'm afraid Athena really hasn't. She never needed any escape from anything. It was all a gift to you, her coming along, as you probably know. I wouldn't want to see you damage the best thing you have going on in your life. I remember when I returned to the States after going to Vietnam for the university, what it felt like to be immersed in chaos for six months. And then, after my flight home touched down at LAX, to sit in my car in the parking lot for an hour before driving back to my apartment, with all that silence and routine waiting for me. I felt depressed for almost a year and a half, because nothing on this side of the world could compare to the grisly drama and the ugly electricity that watching a war up close generated. Now I see you carried away on that same current, living a life that's become weirdly charmed because the country is so up in the air. What I briefly saw of war was revolting and painful and ugly, but it was thrilling in a dark way. And so is this, of course, and I completely understand what it's like for you to feel such energy and vitality during the day and go to sleep with great guilt 
that it's finally found you only because of the dawning of such horror. So you'll go back to Porch Lane, I hope. And maybe you'll have to wait tables at another restaurant or work at a coffee house for less money than any adult should make and feel empty inside too many days of the week and still remain very much lost as to what your life should be. The faster you get back there, though, the better, because that's where Athena wants to be. And as long as you have her, your fight to understand yourself will be far less brutal than it could be. She's extraordinary, Lionel. She'll wait for you to catch up to her. She really will. She would wait for years, which is incredibly rare. And she won't yearn for New York, or another degree, or a real marriage, or children, because her patience is seemingly infinite, but to test that patience would be the act of a damned fool. She knew you were confused when you were driving me to the hospital about where it was, and that for a second you were really panicked, but she never let on. She waited to see if she absolutely had to say something, and then you made the right guess. With her, you've won a lottery whose odds brutalize almost everyone. Never make the mistake of thinking you're so special that you could win it twice. I'm going to do something a little crazy now and leave this note in your shoe, and then walk right on out of this cabin and down the road. There are few things quite as odd and delirious as an old man in tennis shoes walking down a country road and not knowing where he's headed. I hope I get to see you both back on the lane before too much time goes by. I'm dashing off a quick letter of Athena's own, 50 words or so to say goodbye for now, and this one we can keep just between us. Your gray-bearded friend, Mouses. The radio and TV kicked into overdrive with their 24-hour coverage then. Zombies, which had never been disposed of, were waking up somehow and new ones were everywhere. The zombies were definitely aggressive, and while there was no cannibalism going on that anyone could tell, they would have a go at anything from dogs to children. We were all in the van, except Mouses, and I thought I was headed toward the highway, but then I turned off, and nobody said anything. But it was sort of like we were just going to be spinning our wheels, and we should have talked about where to go next before we left the cabin. So we wound up back at the elementary school. I said, look, this should be at least pretty safe for a bit. So there we were, bringing our stuff back in. There was one other stop in there that I remember. I wanted to buy a new notebook. I had run out of room in the one I carried everywhere in which I tried not to open in front of anyone. Even Mouses didn't know what the deal with it was. I told Widgeon and Ronnie I wrote letters to my sister in it and kept careful track of all their heights and weights. They didn't need to know about the notebook. Back at the elementary school, Ronnie and I figured that one thing to do to begin with, when we settled in again, was check the place out from top to bottom, just to make absolutely sure there was nothing in there that might come at us instead of just drifting on by. The two kindergarten rooms were sort of funny, because their ceilings were actually lower than in the other rooms, as if they figured everyone in here was really small, so why not bring the roof down a bit? The first room had been the possession of someone named Mrs. Kirchner. On the chalkboard, someone had written a few sentences, and there was no way of knowing when they had done it, but it looked kind of old. It was a poem. Beside it, they'd drawn a zombie in eight or nine quick slashes. Its arms were reaching out at whoever was looking at it. The poem said this, Lazarus stumbled into a bar, said, Give me three shots of whiskey, for I have come far. The other side's mystery still swirl in my eyes. The party really starts when a man ups and dies. Gather round to learn of the sights I have seen, and pour enough jack to make my tootsies turn green. The bartender nodded and smiled and said, We're all sure impressed you've come back from the dead. But save those damn visions for some cheerier day. You're just going to scare my patrons away. I think from your face, your voice, and that smell, all you can teach us is, it still sucks in hell. 
We opened the door to the principal's office next, and it was the shock of my life. The guy behind the desk in the office was just sitting there in a suit and looking through some papers like it was the middle of a school day and he had reports to file. And suddenly two zombie hunters had stumbled in from another world, like two dimensions had gotten accidentally brushed together, and we were never supposed to have seen each other. I recognized him at once because, of course, this was the guy from the photos in the office, Principal Polly. He had absolutely no expression on his face. There was no shock, no anger, no nothing. He was totally empty. His hair was perfectly neat, and he had this dark blue suit on. And he wasn't saying anything. He said absolutely nothing, so I had to speak. I, I told him we were really sorry that we had come across this school and we thought it was empty and we were going to leave soon. We just stopped in for a little while. Nothing. No response. He was holding these papers in his hands and he set them down and then he got up out of his chair very slowly. Ronnie and I didn't know what else to say. I, I was scared, truly scared, because I thought this guy was nuts. Why wasn't he saying anything? He got to his feet and he came around the desk, moving kind of like an old man, and he moved right past Ronnie, and he went out the door and started walking down the hallway like he was 70 years old instead of just 40 or so. He had a very old walk. I said something like, please stay, something totally useless, but the exit doors are right there, and he pushed on the middle bar and went out the door. There was no car out there or anything. He just walked across the parking lot and across the road. He didn't look left or right to see if any cars were coming. He went onto the jogging path that went all the way to the middle of town, and he walked down it and out of sight. I looked at Ronnie, and he looked at me, and I said, Hey, Ronnie, is it possible, just remotely possible, that we just talk to a goddamn zombie? This letter shall end, dear sister, with one last description of an occurrence which simply could not have really taken place, and yet it did. I saw my stalker zombie one more time. It was that very same evening. My zombie in the house dress was in the field that sloped away from the playground, wandering from east to west, never seeing me. How could I tell it was her when it was two o'clock in the morning and I was so far away? Well, there was a full moon out and she had a certain kind of walk and blah, blah, blah. But what it all comes down to was that I just knew. I assume the postal system is still up and running and they've just added nor the walking dead to that little rhyme of theirs. So this recording should get to you in a few days. Say hi to the husband and the Totniks. Stay indoors when you can. And write me back at Porch Lane for when I get back there, eventually. And um, tell me what I should call the book I'm going to list all these stories in. It'll have to have a very original name, mind you, because the world is going to be full of books just like this one in no time at all. I'll call you soon. Love, Lionel. In scene 31 of Song of the Living Dead by Douglas Widgeon, shown on Minnesota Public Television in December of 2006, the narrator of the documentary explains that in the second week of May, Melissa's friend Lionel, hey, that's me, drove her to a Denny's restaurant in Gettysburg, where her father would pick her up and take her home. She'd been on the road with her friends for more than three weeks, but they decided finally that it was too complicated and probably too dangerous to keep her with them any longer. When they arrived at the restaurant, Melissa's father was not yet there, so they sat in the van for a half hour and waited. We hadn't said much on the drive up there, and we just listened to the news, I guess. When we got there, we were looking at this guy who was across the parking lot, sitting on the little step in front of Denny's, which was closed. And this guy was just sitting there with his head down, almost like he was asleep, but... He had one arm stretched out and he was petting this dog who was sitting beside him, petting him with one arm over and over and over again in exactly the same pattern, but never looking up. We were watching that and I decided to, I don't know, be an adult for Melissa for once. 
All this time, I hadn't bothered with all that. That was more Athena's job. But now she wasn't around. She'd already hugged Melissa goodbye. I wanted Melissa to remember that exact moment, the time when she was waiting for her father to come and get her. I told her that as soon as she got out of the van, she wouldn't really be 17 anymore, that she would have aged somehow, just in the past couple of months. By going back with her parents, I thought it would sink into her without her ever even knowing it, how suddenly she would be more than 17. She would be an age that had no number. I told her that because of the zombies, she might feel angry sometimes and not really understand why. I told her not to let anything make her forget that she was young. Not her parents, not the zombies, not anything. That night, I really wanted her to turn out the lights when she went to bed and say to herself, I am young. I am young. I am young. I know, I was an idiot for trying to teach her everything I learned in the parking lot of Denny's. And it got all mixed up in my mind, and it didn't come out right. And Melissa started to cry. In the documentary, she tells Douglas Widgeon that she does want to be like other people. She wants to have a nice house someday and a good, boring job, and get married and live in a little neighborhood somewhere and drive one of those cars nobody notices. And she says on screen, she'll have a bunch of cats, too, and two kids and spend her weekends at Home Depot and go on vacation in Ocean City. And when people ask her about the zombies, she'll say, oh yeah, w way back when, that was a really big deal for a while. It was like 9-11 in the Vietnam War. But, you know, we got over it. Her father pulled up there at Denny's finally. When they drove away, I was still sitting in the van. I'd promised her I wouldn't go anywhere until she was out of sight, because... I didn't want it to feel like me and Athena and the rest were leaving her. I wanted it to feel like the other way around. So the van stayed and Melissa went. Wherever it was she was going to. When I got back that night, Ronnie was already gone. He'd stayed till about four and then he'd called a cab and he talked the dispatcher into sending a cab that would take him all the way down to Point of Rocks. There was a commuter train to Washington from there, and he said he'd improvise his way further south, maybe figure out a way to get on a bus, take a chance, and show his ID. Athena said he had just tapped lightly on the door to the library, where she was looking through some books. His backpack had been slung over his shoulder, and he said, Take care, okay? And he left without another word. I liked Ronnie. He was a big... Muscular guy, but he, he wanted to be invisible. He thought going into the army was going to keep him invisible. It just didn't turn out that way. After Ronnie left, it was just Athena and Douglas in the school, so she turned on the radio, but then she turned it off again right away after hearing the top story on the news, which was about that man who was attacked and killed inside the movie theater in Miami, supposedly. And she didn't want to hear any more. Douglas smoked just outside the main entrance. He said as he looked out on the road, he had a mental image of a million zombies walking at us, coming from over the hill, all with their arms stretched out towards us and nowhere to run to. 4,000 troops have been called out to go on emergency elimination missions, as they were called, meaning they were out to destroy whatever was walking around with something less than the tact which they had tried to summon up till now. On the drive back from Gettysburg, I'd had to make three detours because the army had closed down a road, obviously to make a kill. Three detours, that was a lot. Traffic was a killer too because a lot of people were getting the hell out of whatever town they were in. They were just up and leaving. They were getting harder to put down too, the zombies were. That was hearsay, anecdotes reported from person to person, and finally winding up on the radio. But it was a hell of a lot of anecdotal evidence. It really was. You know, at one point, I forget what station did it. They played the Star Spangled Banner, some old scratchy recording from some LP. Just up and did it out of nowhere. And that was very strangely poignant. I wonder what message they were trying to convey with that. 
We all took the van out and went to the grocery store. We had to stand in line for half an hour. People were just buying anything and everything. They had a couple of cops hanging around the place in case of trouble, either from the dead or from the living who just didn't feel like paying for their bread and toilet paper. Mouses once told me that one of the scariest moments a country can face is not when it's about to be attacked or invaded or occupied, because that very sense of terror can stir up a a reactionary patriotism, he said. No, something scarier is when the bottom drops out of everything and no one cares about their home anymore. He'd felt it in countries where the government pushed things too far against its own people and the people struck back, destroying not just their leaders but the infrastructure of the land as well. He used to say you could feel it when a small nation's economy fell right through the floor when their money became useless. The dead becoming violent, I think, broke the last mental defenses of people who already tended to believe the universe was random and that God had checked out of the scene a long time ago. They reacted by staging bizarre parades, by defacing the country with billions of splashes of graffiti, by leaving their jobs again. Some reacted with violence, terrible violence. As bad as things got, one fact was always sadly true, that the number of people killed by zombies that year was drastically less than the number of people who killed each other in the worst of all possible reactions to them. That night, Athena and I laid together in the dark in my sleeping bag. We didn't say anything, nothing at all, for a long time. And then she asked me where we were going the next morning. I asked her if we could go just a little bit farther, a little bit farther. Athena, please. But we would go north, the three of us, back in the direction we'd come from. And we'd roam back on that general path toward Porch Lane. I I just wanted to see what happened. That was all. I was just curious to see what was what. There really were an awful lot of disturbances on the roads, and we traveled back routes all the way. There were twice as many cars on those country roads as normal, and twice we were stopped dead for a while, and when we finally got caught up, we saw that what had caused the delay was mostly rubbernecking. There was a gigantic tidal movement toward rural areas. Anybody who had a friend living in the middle of nowhere wanted a few nights' stay. Athena was aghast at our diet that day because we couldn't find one roadside stand that was open to sell us veggies. That was a really ominous sign. I didn't see how anything could stop a farmer from needing to sell his crops, but this apparently had. There was this little place, Sazzler's Hardware, on the side of Route 109, and it was open so we pulled in. Douglas said we should probably, just in case, have a little something to knock one of the bastards over if we got surprised, right? Athena stayed in the van, and we went shopping. She was pretty disturbed by the idea. We bought three crowbars. The owner asked us if we wanted a handwritten receipt because the printer inside the register was out of ribbon. And Douglas said, Oh, does that mean we can return these when we're done with them? That was one feeling for the record books, holding that thing in my hands. It was totally ridiculous, but boy, did I feel ready to use it. Come and get me, that's what I thought. I must have been going out of my mind. Around about six, on the day we left the school for good, after driving northeast for three hours, kind of stop and go, Douglas mentioned the studios. The studios where WRTH used to videotape their programming were scheduled to be torn down. And it was basically just two big warehouses sitting in the hills outside of York. Douglas thought that no one had used them for going on two months and figured it would be the perfect place to crash for the night if we wanted. They'd taken down the fencing around the studios and hauled them off to the new ones in the city, so it wouldn't be much of a problem getting in, and he was almost certain not a soul would be there or within like a mile of the place. The only problem might be that we'd have to break into the studio buildings themselves. And as soon as I heard that, of course, I said, yeah, let's go there. Douglas had been there two or three times doing some editing work. It was really remote. To get there, we just drove through a little unattended gate and down a long dirt road. It was public television, so there was no writs to it, no secrecy or security. 
RTH had apparently been on the verge of selling the property outright to the golf course adjacent to it. They were going to bulldoze the trees between the course and the studios and add some new holes or something. But the new studios were already up and running in the city, and it was just a matter of time before these old ones were torn down. The gate was unlocked, and it didn't seem like anyone else was around. There were no cars in the little dirt lot. I just had a lousy feeling about the place. Athena said to me, come on, let's, let's go to a motel. I said, yeah, you're, you're probably right, but let's check it out. Maybe we'll change our mind. And then I gave her a crowbar, and I gave Douglas his, and we went in with protection. That part of the place had no windows, not one, because, of course, that would have messed with the lighting on the sets. So we had to jimmy one of the doors. And there were some light switches right next to our heads when we went in, and about half of them still worked, so we could see everything, even though it was a little bit dim, since the lights were set about 30 feet above us. RTH really had no money at all, Douglas said, so there weren't even any walls between the sets. They'd tape a segment of their money show in Space C, which was five feet away and not separated at all from Space B, where they did a kid's show. It was kind of like a cheap studio apartment blown up to 20 times normal size. The funny thing was that right in front of us was a bedroom set. A period thing, like for Masterpiece Theater or something. There were props suggesting the turn of the century, and there was an old-fashioned wrought iron bed with a mattress and covers and I looked at Athena and said now do you want to go to a motel? She put her crowbar down on the bed and we looked around. She didn't want to carry it. There was no sense in it, right? We guys had ours. And nothing really bad could happen to us because we were special. We were the good guys. Everything that was happening was just a big movie screen and we were watching it and not really involved. Being in that studio was so perfect, seeing these empty sets and the backdrops that had been painted for imaginary plots. None of it was real. Athena was glad Melissa wasn't there as soon as we turned on the lights. She didn't want her to try to become an actress, to play with all this illusion stuff. She didn't want her living in a dream world. There was one backdrop that had been painted, and I really wanted to know what it had been used for. It was fascinating. Douglas and I were going through a bunch of them because they were all leaning against one wall. And he would get on one side, and I would get on the other, and we would push them forward, one by one, just looking at them. The one we found which was so strange and puzzling was a 10 by 20 foot slab showing a reddened horizon and a huge bunch of zombies spread out over it, walking toward the viewer. And in the foreground, there was just one man looking into the distance and waiting for them to come. And I don't think he was even a man. I think he was a boy. He wasn't armed or anything because obviously this backdrop had been drawn before the zombies had become violent. What he did have in his hands was a violin and he was playing it. So the effect was the zombies had been drawn out of the hills and over the horizon by the sound of his playing like a fairy tale, almost. It was so big, this thing, they must have been planning a very unusual show or documentary or play or whatever. Near the back of the studio, or at least what I thought was the back, was a huge wall, but it was one of those sliding ones. I guess they closed it when they needed silence on the other side. I misjudged the size of the place. It was far bigger than I had thought. I never asked Douglas why he had suddenly felt the need to open that wall. I think he just wanted to see everything. I had jogged over to help him with the bolt that locked the wall. Athena was five feet away when we started to slide the wall open. Now I think back on what Douglas had told us about that reality show his acquaintance had been planning, the one about all the zombies on the island, and the crazy story that maybe someone had collected some to use. Douglas had said no one thought they'd really gone so far as to do that, but if they had, they would have had to put them someplace. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere, so no one would get suspicious or ever find them until they needed them. I think, what are the odds that the story was true and that they really said, well, we know exactly a place we can use. And when I think the odds are 
absurdly slim or any of that transpiring, well, then I think of the chances of the dead returning to life and attacking the living, and my head begins to hurt. If the universe can think of such things to throw at us, Athena once said to me, human beings are even worse. They always have been. They always will be. We shoved the wall to the left along its rollers, and it had gotten maybe four feet when the zombies started pouring out at us. When we let go of the wall, it slid another four feet or so, and they all came at us from that eight-foot gap. The force of their momentum through the gap pushed it little by little even further left until by the end, by the time they were all out, the wall was a third of the way open. We still had our crowbars in our hands, Douglas and I did. But when Douglas stumbled backwards and one of the zombies landed on top of him, I looked up right away and I saw that Athena did not have hers. There had been no smell to lead us to believe that the wall hid 30 zombies, 50 maybe, we hadn't heard any shuffling or movement, nothing. When they appeared, I went totally numb, and my shouting to Athena was just instinct. A zombie was right in front of me, but there was one just to my left, too, which was where Athena was standing. So I swung at that one first, a woman, having no conscious thought whatsoever in my brain. I went right for her head, and I swung as hard as I could. The sound was like I'd hit a bag of seed or something, and that one went down. And then I swung back at the one right in front of me, and I got him in the neck with the hook part. And something weird happened to his eyes when it went in. His corneas just shot to the right, and then he went down too. Douglas had managed to get on top of the one which had pinned him down, and he got up almost falling over. And he swung his crowbar right down on the thing's head. I had no revulsion. I didn't gasp in terror. And that all left me instantaneously. The new things we'd become didn't even know their own names. Athena hadn't run. The first thing I saw her do was whip her right fist against the side of some zombie's face viciously hard and knocking it aside. She just started swinging, and she hit me in the shoulder with one of the swings, which I only felt much later when the bruise formed. One of the zombies she hit kept coming at her, and it grabbed her left arm, so I hit it in the back with the crowbar, and at the same time I felt those cold fingers go into my mouth. I spat them out and I felt something's arms around my waist, but I had to get that zombie off Athena's arm because it was opening its mouth and going for her skin. I hit it in the back of the head. Blood flew up and hit Athena in the neck. Then I just started shoving the butt end of the crowbar against the forehead of the one that had me until it slid off me. The most awful part was that for a second or two I couldn't see Athena at all because we were literally surrounded. I kept screaming her name and she kept screaming mine. I swung the crowbar until I got to her. She had blood all over her and at first I thought it was hers, but it was because I had been hitting these things in the head so hard that it kept spraying on her. Douglas was kneecapping them, putting them down instead of going for the heads. Athena just pushed them, slapped them, punched them, anything she could. She tried to grab my hand to pull me out of there, but I was in the midst of swinging the crowbar and it tore me free of her. Going for the knees was more effective, yes. But I found myself not doing that. I found myself looking into their eyes and hitting them in the head with absolutely all the force I could muster. And I think once that when I missed, I came very close to hitting Athena. But I tell myself that I can't really know if she was still that close, though I sensed she was. I think I came very close indeed to hitting her. I couldn't control myself. I just knew that if I connected solidly with the heads, it meant I got to keep standing for a couple of more seconds. The last zombie I saw Athena hit, she brought her fist against the side of its head and it went off balance a bit, but it was still standing, so she took a step forward and hit it again in the same place and it was fully tumbling over, falling to the floor, its tongue protruding from its stupid mouth. But she went after it to hit it one more time, just full of rage, full of the wanting to punish it to make the zombie go down instead of just watching it fall. That led her far away from me, so I ran to her. And Douglas had gotten free and gotten there too, and we got away. The door we had entered had that broken knob, so Athena just threw her weight fully against it, and we were out. In the zombie movies I used to watch with my friends, 
No matter how bad things got, there were always two or three survivors left. The heroes. And they went into the sunset or whatever to fight another day. The people who made these movies were always careful to have some hope at the end. Mouses used to stroke his beard and say what would have been interesting before all this is if they'd made a zombie story and in the end the zombies truly won. They finally got rid of all the humans on the earth so that there couldn't be any band of survivors to go underground to repopulate. All that would be left would be the billions of buildings around the world that people had built before they had all been devoured. There wouldn't be a single sound left except for the footsteps of the zombies. With the last dying breath of the final hero, all of human history would suddenly vanish, and all the meaning and all the property and structures on the earth would disappear. The dead would wander those structures aimlessly, never starving, never laying down. The seasons would change and they would walk. Earthquakes would strike and they would walk. And that movie, Mouses said, could end with three straight silent minutes of zombies and their meaningless shuffling. Just the sound of the wind over a protracted montage of the earth, finally possessed by a race that didn't even care to own it. How peaceful, Mouses used to say. How perfect. How darkly beautiful in a way that can't be put into words. Douglas Widgeon's documentary, Song of the Living Dead, did eventually air, 18 months after our awful evening at the studios of WRTH. The 80-minute film featured not only Melissa, but four other people under the age of 18, including a 12-year-old blind boy and a 16-year-old who was put in jail briefly for torturing zombies. Over the end credits, that 12-year-old boy stood in a field and played his violin. And I knew right away where Widgeon had gotten that image from, the backdrop we'd found at the studio. He left me a message at Porch Lane telling me when the show would be on, and when it was over I called him and talked to him for the first time in a year and a half. He was doing fine, he said. He was in upstate New York and planning a film about the Battle of Antietam. About two months after he and I and Athena fought the zombies at RTH, Douglas had felt himself sinking into a severe depression. He assumed it was because of what had happened that night, and he went on antidepressants and stopped working on his movie. It took him about six months to start feeling himself again, and now he thought he was going to be all right. When he asked me if I was somehow different since then, I honestly told him, no, not really. I wanted to be, but I wasn't. The nightmares just never came. But then I had Athena, and Douglas had no one. Melissa never saw the documentary. She just didn't feel like watching it. Her parents never moved back to the house they'd owned just around the corner from me and Athena. They have stayed in New Brunswick, Ontario since last June, and Melissa goes to school there now. Athena calls her once a month and tries to get Melissa to focus on her college plans. Things have not gotten any better between her and her parents, not at all. Athena thinks it's Melissa's determination to get away from them as soon as she can that keeps her grounded, keeps her away from partying and boys and cheerleading, keeps her grades nice and even. She has friends. It's going to be all right. Ronnie called us from Seattle last December. He was still AWOL and still had no intention of going back to the Army. He was working for a food co-op, and he really enjoyed it. He'd never found out the ultimate fate of his parents down in Georgia, and he felt ashamed about that. Mouses writes to me and Athena every couple of months. I don't think he's coming back to the lane anytime soon. He has been back and forth across the country twice. He has hitchhiked, ridden a Vespa, and he knows I always wanted one of those. Ridden Greyhound, bought a $300 car that smelled like beets. The postmarks on his letters are always different. At the end of every letter, he tells me not to be envious. There's no point to that. I am envious every single day. Meanwhile, the dead continue to walk. They're pretty avoidable. It's kind of rare that you see one, but they're still out there. 
and still somewhat combative. The recession is still going on and it's still brutal. America is still being viciously criticized for its decisions to send troops to areas of the world where it believes that sudden destabilizations due to zombie threats might make things a little too precarious for democracy. I finally did find out the identity of the zombie in the house dress, the one I accused of stalking me, the one I saw all those times hanging around the elementary school and elsewhere. Using my photograph, an outfit based in Atlanta called the Search Tex scanned my close-up photo of the woman's face and in just a few weeks provided me with the answer to my question. She was Beverly Briarly, and she was my fourth grade teacher at Hillsmere Elementary School in Annapolis, about 60 miles from Gerard Manley Hopkins Elementary School in Buckystown, where our little gang stayed for a few nights that sunny and cloudless spring. She was just 25 or so when I was her student. I hadn't seen her in all that time, but when I saw her face, something had clicked. One day way back then, my folks had gone in for a parent-teacher conference with Mrs. Briarly. When they came out of it, they took me out for a banana split. They were so happy with what she had told them about me. She thought that I was one of those children who could probably be anything I wanted when I grew up. That the future was boundless for me. She didn't like it when I goofed off too much, or did less than I was capable of. If only I applied myself, she said, my intelligence would carry me far. I might even be famous. I told her I thought I might want to be a writer. She said then you are going to be a writer. She was proud of me. She believed in me. That was Mrs. Briarly. I'm here on Porch Lane now, and seven restaurants in town have closed since Z-Day 2, but I found some good hours at one that stayed open. And I think about her all the time. All the time. I'm writing this last part from 188 Porch Lane in the bedroom of the house I share with Athena who's lying asleep after teaching a class at the community center where in return for several hours a week of instructing people in basic painting she's provided with a studio of her own sometimes she's there working all day and teaching all night and doesn't get home until like 11 or so but we have weekends together still for another month or so and then I have to start working Saturdays and just a few hours on Sundays, so we'll figure something out. We share the car, and I usually walk to work. It keeps me in shape. A couple of years ago, I, I went down to the pharmacy for some cough medicine or something, and I wound up also buying a five-subject notebook, a big, thick blue deal, which I thought I'd use for random notes and jottings. Sometimes I would get frustrated by something I saw in the news and I would turn to the middle section of the notebook and scroll a few words down about it. Once in a while I would see a, a severely handicapped person on the street or hear about some tragedy that didn't make any sense to me. And some words about these things went into the book as well. More and more recently I would be reacting to some decision this country had made regarding uh, throwing its weight around overseas or its treatment of people I considered most in need of help, who weren't getting much of it, or America's embrace of violence in all its seemingly mild forms, from all the killing on TV shows to the fact that every movie poster seemed to be suggesting its hero was the definition of cool because he was wielding two guns against three bad guys. Most of what I wrote was indecipherable nonsense, gut reactions to issues I did not fully understand. I realized that. Then in December of last year, there was a tragedy that struck Athena and I, and I found myself writing in the last section of the notebook. A very long story to take my mind off things, something ridiculous and implausible. It was so far-fetched, see, that it actually seemed to help me a little. When all was said and done, my story was mostly about a confused 32-year-old man who had misplaced the joy of living in a world where such beauty coexisted with such horror. So maybe there never were any zombies. No Z-Day 1 or Z-Day 2. No controversial acts of military brutality. No travels across a couple of states with a group of my friends 
and the professional artist Athena Carew. Not that these people aren't real. They all are. Everyone who came with Athena and I in that van, Mouses, Ronnie, Douglas Widgeon, and Melissa, friends or acquaintances, or maybe even just people we met very briefly once and exchanged no more than a few words with. But the things they did and said, maybe they all came from the imagination of a man who hasn't written a story since he was 11 years old and doesn't really understand too many of the rules of plausibility and linear plot and had to resort to telling a tale of flesh-hungry zombies to relate his saddest fears about a world where some poisoned food would suddenly rip the life away from a 17-year-old friend of Athena's who lived around the corner from us and daydreamed of getting away from her parents and of becoming an actress or working in fashion and going with us if we went to Amsterdam one summer. Melissa Lansford died in December of 2002, a victim of random chance and gross human negligence, a death that seemed designed to shock its witnesses into a hideous, revolted silence. Death took her in a particularly harsh, cowardly, uneducational way, and shortly afterward, out came my tale of zombies of running the planet, written in longhand across 109 pages. It was my way of challenging the universe to a contest of savagery. I wanted to write about a darkness so absurd that it would make darkness seem almost funny. Even in fiction, I couldn't quite keep us all together. But for a while, at least, I really did feel like I was driving that van, and we were all free of everything. I knew exactly what it would be like to cruise along the smooth blacktop of Bucky's Town Pike with the driver's side window rolled down and my friends passing around a map. It was like being told I would be young for a hundred years. Now Athena is sleeping a few feet away from me. She has been, and remains, my last line of defense against everything I imagine which lies outside the window to my left. Disease, violence, failure, senseless destruction, murder, intolerance. Here, she has created a paradise for me. I've done what I can for her, though it can never be enough. She is smarter than I am, more successful than I feel I can ever be, more patient, more kind. One step outside the door of 188 Porch Lane and I am Lionel the waiter in the college dropout. To her, in our four-room house, I am somehow still Lionel the Great. Her love for me is mysterious and deep. Our friend Mouses once told me so in a letter, a letter I've reproduced, not quite verbatim, in this story. In a few minutes, I'll curl up beside her and say a little prayer. Help me be strong, Athena, I'll say. My country is not as pure as I had always believed it to be, and I'm not either, and phantoms are everywhere. There are sunsets and oceans and images of you brushing your hair on our port swing, and there are gunshots and freak accidents and people to whom cruelty is only a means to an end they believe is just. The images flash by me, too many to be counted, alternating between good and evil, and it seems impossible it can all exist so close to each other on the same earth. I believe you love me and always will. And I believe a boy's beautifully played violin could summon hungry zombies from over the horizon and that music could come from a dead woman's throat. Yes, darkness and light are so close together, so relentlessly at war, that this can all be. I have written it down in permanent pen. Nightmares dreamed in a field of perfect May grass, a bridesmaid fixed in a rifle sight. Words in a notebook you don't ever need to understand, which I will keep secretly for both of us, for as long as you stand beside me. <laughs>